they told me to start before. The, I think it's because we are all, uh, it's very intensive day, and we are the last one, and also we are the economists. Then I don't know, I hope uh, uh, you will be entertaining as we have uh, entertained during all the presentation. I need to say that for my presentation, I only have a picture, just to, to be sure. Well, I, uh, I am the chair of this session, and I am a professor, I am very recent a researcher here, and I also co held the chair of the Research Industrial Alliance sur les enjeux économiques, des changements démographiques, that I co, co hold with a Professor Lacroix, that it will be the last speaker. I left the best for the end. And also Ismael is also a researcher from the chair. Then that I will, uh, this, this two uh, piece of work that we will present are very different one from the other, uh, but uh, we want to show you what we do in the economy of aging related with health. Then this uh, paper is about uh, retirement and connective functioning, and it's a, a research comparing international evidence, and it's a joint paper with Ari Kapten and Gemma Zamar. Why is it interesting to study the effect of retirement on cognitive function? Uh, if you think that staying longer in the, work, in the working life can uh, reduce uh, the cognitive functioning or can maintain the, reserve, the cognitive reserve, but in this uh, case, we will do different implementation and policies that if is the boss or positive. Then if we preserve our cognitive capacity uh, with staying working in the labor market, then we will encourage uh, workers to stay in this market. Uh, and this can have the effect that uh, different effects in different economic things, and not only economy. One, for example, is that it will be help us to support the financial sustainability of pension systems, because more people working, more people that are contributing to the pension systems. But also, we will reduce the health care burden, because people will be in health. And not only uh, that, people, if they have cognition, if they have memory, they can also have more individual uh, decisions and also financial decisions. And then they can do good saving decisions. And something that is not economy, because economists, we are interested in well-being. This is our main uh, purpose, to maintain well-being, to increase well-being. Uh, this can also increase the well-being and the quality of life in late ages. Our study that we do in this uh, paper that I uh, show you is we reviewed the literature in economics uh, that studied the relation of retirement on cognitive uh, abilities. And we do more. We do, we replicate all the studies to compare why you have different outcomes. And we go more, we uh, extend our analysis with different, uh, introducing different covariates and different methods. And the data that we use for this study is the, the three similar surveys. They are a longitudinal surveys, and they are very interesting uh, surveys because they, use, uh, they, they, they interview people uh, 50 uh, and over uh, in age, but also they, uh, they have different questions for different variable, they are health variable, they are social variable, they are economic variables, then we have a very uh, important set of variables that we can link one with each other. Also, these data sets are very interesting because they are harmonized and they are for different countries. For example, HRS is for US, ESA is for England, and SER is for Europe. You can also ask why is not Canada here? It's because that's an assist and harmonized data uh, for Canada and Canada didn't want to, to be involved in this kind of data set. I need to say that it's not only these countries that are involved, they are also China, Japan, India, Mexico, and a lot of more countries. Canada didn't want to compare with the others, I don't know why. Uh, they have, however, a uh, uh, survey that is the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, 
that uh, it will be longitudinal, I think the second way will give, but there are almost two years that I tried to use this data, and I did even proposals, but I didn't have access, even if the data are public. Then, then one of my proposals is to do this kind of research also for Canada. Then, uh, first of all, the main, the dependent value, the most important value in our study is the uh, cognitive uh, functioning. And uh, how we use this variable, there are several variables in the data set, but we use one that was the most similar that they use in the other studies in order to do comparison, and is the recall summary score of maximum 20 words. 10 words, that in the, the immediate word recall, I think you know more on, of in this variable than I, but in any case, I, I will explain to you that the interview takes a list of 10 nouns and to the respondent and the individuals are asked to recall as many words as possible. And then five minutes later, they, that is the delayed word recall, they ask again how many words they recall. Then this is the main variable that we have, even if we have robustness with other kind of variables in connectivity. Then when we do the survey on this literature, uh, the most of the, the studies they agree that cognitive ability is declined with age. That is also something that you know already, but the economists, we, we were uh, uh, studying this uh, to relate with our economic variables that you will see. But we also see that uh, cognitive abilities are related to the uh, gender and marital status. Other studies, they think that is very important, childhood experience and parental background, and different uh, outcomes of health uh, status, uh, for example, chronic conditions are very important also to, that are related to cognitive abilities. Behavioral variables are very important. Every personality traits as to be patient or the risk aversion are also related to, to cognitive, uh, cognitive functioning. And also some evidence uh, as education, activities, and occupation will affect an individual's cognitive research. This is uh, the survey of the, the several studies that we uh, will uh, sum. Here, that we find is with our data set. Let me see how it's working in this. No, I don't know how to. Ah, yes. I see. Ah, yes. Here. These are our countries that we uh, study. And uh, as you can see, uh, this, the, this is the work, this is the dark red, and the slightly red is, uh, is the people who are retired. And you can see that in all countries, the proportion of the, the cognitive functioning is lower for the retired than for the work, the people who are working. This is the only picture that you will see. And here, uh, that uh, we then do is to revise uh, this and to replicate this, these uh, studies, and uh, we, that they use the most of them, or one of the survey, or two of the surveys, uh, and one year, several years. Then we revise all the results, and all the papers agree that there are a negative relationship between retirement and cognitive capability. However, the important thing is not to see if there are a relationship between cognitive functioning and retirement. The most important thing is to see if this relation is causal or not. Why? Because if I feel that I have a decrease in cognitive abilities, I must decide to retire. But uh, it's different if I retire and I decrease my cognitive abilities. Then this is that we want to, to, to distinguish because the policy are very different. If it's before retiring, it's very different the, the, the how we need to intervene, or you, more than the <laughs> economy, but we propose policies, and very different if we uh, have the decline because we stop our activity in the labor market. Then, uh, economists, we are uh, interested in to correct for this uh, 
reverse that I uh, described now is the reverse causation. But we also have other factors that they can create endogeneity, as for example, uh, unobservables. For example, we, that we said before, people who are less stressed than others, calmer, this can affect also your cognitive abilities or your persistence. These are things that are personality traits that normally we cannot uh, distinguish in the data set. And then these kind of things need to be correct for our uh, tools. And this is that the most of the review of this paper and that we replicate uh, do is that they use different mechanisms and different specifications to correct these endogenities. In general, that they use are the instrumental variables that are the policies that, for example, uh, in this case, is eligible age for early and full pensions benefits that are related with in, the, in, in a exogenous way with uh, retirement, and they can correct if there are really a relationship with uh, cognitive abilities. These are the 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 the, the studies that we uh, replicate, and I will not go longer in describing the the results. But to summary, that uh, there is not a clear consensus in the literature. Uh, that we find is that some papers find negative effect on retirement and cognition, and other a positive effect, especially when they disaggregate for type of occupation, and others no, no significant at all. That means that this, this negative relationship that it was so obvious, now is not, in a causal way, is not so obvious, not so clear. Then, uh, and even with different well-done papers, it's not so clear neither, because any uh, different set of papers, they have different outcomes. Then we, need, we wanted to understand why. It was uh, because they were all skipping something, it was for the methodology, then that we did is to first replicate and also to extend our analysis. That we do, uh, we did is um, to, uh, to, we have a larger set of uh, variables because the most of these papers, they use one year or two years, we, we, we use free, free waves and they are, some of these uh, uh, studies, they use only one country or two, we use 13 countries. And we uh, pull the data and we use the, all the specification that they did and more. And uh, our results were that if we only control for age, the retirement has a causal negative effect on cognitive function, but just controlling by age. But more control we add, that means more individual characteristics we uh, include in our models, the lower the estimated is. Uh, the Fed. The, we also uh, observe that there are a, a large uh, difference if we uh, examine uh, survey by survey, by HRS alone, or when we pull. When we do, when we pull, we we have uh, several interesting results. But when we do HRS alone, it's, a lot, it's very different. That when we have share alone. Then that means that there are something that happens maybe in uh, institutional by country. Then in our uh, models, we have country uh, fixed effects to control for this difference uh, that we have, for example, in institutions uh, by country. And uh, our main conclusion, uh, replicating and extending, is that the outcomes are very sensitive to the econometric specification, and it's not clear we didn't find uh, a clear causal relationship, except that it's age, yes, but when we want to see what is the group that we need to focus, because uh, when we control for individual characteristics, we, we don't find the same effects depending on the country, depending on the, the group. And to put an example is that, for example, when we examine different populations, for example, we divide our sample just uh, for men, and we do the same analysis for women. Uh, for, for, to put an example, the average for men in the survey is nine, to recall is 9.6 words, while women recall 10.4 uh, words. Then men, in, in more richer in specification, are statistically insignificant. However, 
any uh, any country with any specification with any the richer and the more controlling by reverse causality and observable, the uh, women they were, the relation was negative and only statistically significant. That means that for women it seems that something is quite robust. That it seems that a real uh, uh, Real relationship between uh, to be retired and, and to, to decline their uh, cognitive uh, research. We also, for example, we examine different groups of occupation because people said, okay, it's not the same. Someone who all their life they work in a job where in have physical uh, effort, yeah, uh, the physical effort is, is, is large than someone who the, is more intellectual, who is intellectual uh, in between. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, then, that we did is uh, two different definitions for uh, define uh, the physical effort. One is one that uh, in the survey they ask directly uh, for the physical effort in the currently job directly, or in also in the, in the, in the last, in, in their uh, uh, more longer, work uh, job uh, in their lives and we we build this uh, this variable and the second is constructed by occupational uh, categories uh, to give an idea the physical demanding jobs recall it was about 10 words for the people that they declare having uh, a job where the four of physically uh, physical for it was uh, harder and when the less physical it was 11. But when we use the most, uh, most richer and specific, and we control for the, uh, uh, all the, the covariance and with the, uh, the richer specification, uh, we don't find any uh, in a difference between these groups. It could be because in between 10 words and 11 words, I don't know if the, in, it could be that there is not too many difference that the, uh, it could be also because we need to go further, no? And then this is not uh, as uh, determined. In fact, I am uh, starting to conclude uh, in the fact that, uh, you see, it was very interesting uh, doing this work, but except for women that really we, we find very strong results and very robust results, for the rest of the groups and for the rest of the variables that we, uh, we could think that we could find something we didn't find. Then it's probably that the retirement has a negative effect on cognition function that is not so clear is what are the group that we need to target, and this is very important. Then more research should be done, and probably also interacting with you uh, is, is more uh, need to be done. And uh, the, um, well, as conclusion, really the conclusion is that I, I, I just came to, to say before is that uh, there is this uh, uh, evidence that there are connection between retirement uh, to uh, declining cognitive functioning, uh, but it's not so clear uh, um, in, in the groups except for women. And uh, maybe uh, one thing to that I when I was uh, doing this this uh, work was I was thinking is that maybe in the medical literature they give more importance not only to work but to the activity. Then maybe that we mix is that after retirement uh, it's not so clear to find this negative correlation because there are people who even if they stop working they are still active because they are involved in a lot of activities in, in with their family with the neighborhood with, and these people they are not working in the labor market but they are working in their lives they are working with their with, with their mind and this I think is something that is to be introduced here something how to to how to capture these uh, these activities after retirement. And uh, in terms of methodology, I think even in the richer one, we don't find we need to introduce uh, all the new coverage, as I mentioned, on to develop uh, new methodologies. Then thank you very much, and I am very for questions. Okay, then I will. Uh, uh, ah, ah. <laughs> Whether you distinguish between
between uh, places where, uh, and maybe you, you mentioned that and I, I, I didn't hear, but places where uh, retirement is uh, mandatory, so there's a mandatory age versus you select when you're going to take your Because I, my impression is it makes you do no, yeah, in fact, uh, uh, we control for, we, we use the exogenous, the regulation as exogenous because we need to, to capture the causality, but then into the models, we also, for example, we do different specification of retirement, for example, the distance of the individual between the year of retirement and how many years are in retirement, for example. And we also did different specification to capture how many years people are in retirement, or also uh, um, in terms of institutions, I think we capture that because we do country fixed effects. Then in this, uh, when we when we control for country fixed effects, that we are doing is everything that is different regulation in one country is capturing in this in this variable. Okay. Mm. So, so, so you control. Yeah. But did you examine it? Yeah, 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 we examine so if, yeah. For, mm -hmm. instance, for instance, in Europe, where there's a mandatory age of retirement, uh, my impression is that the, it might be much less favorable because you, it's, not, it's not that the retirement age is, is not adjusted to when you're ready to retire. No, it's true. You know, impose it from, well, particularly when you don't want to retire. Yeah, uh, I didn't examine in terms that they uh, analyze, but we have the coefficient and we can see if in the country where there are more, ma yes, this I can, uh, early retirement, I can examine. I didn't need it, but it's very interesting, yes, I can study this, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, huh? yes. yeah. Yeah, I was going to intervene on the same theme. I think retirement is a failing concept. So you should be very aware of when people are effectively retiring. That's the first question. My, my first point, I'm sorry. My second question, or my second point would be about what about crossing these results with um, um, meta studies on access to training from age 40 or 45? Because there is something happening in the workplace where especially in Europe and the, <coughs> the country you are looking at, you don't have any access to training past 40, 45. Then your brain plasticity for sure is shrinking or it's, you know, diminishing. So is it retirement or is it a learning in the workplace that is a major indicator of no, I, I think it is very interesting that you said in the in the model exactly difference across different countries it could be captured because this country fits effect that we could not be capturing that is uh, in the same country if there are uh, people that they their employers they offer this training compared to the other this we don't capture and I think it's a very interesting thing in terms of retirement just to clarify that the 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 that when we uh, we have also interactions between retirement and age, then we know exactly when the people are retired. Then it's not only the institutional, the institutional is the salinous variables that we interact with the real retirement, and we know when the, is the, the person retired, and we control for that. But uh, the, it's true that they are training in middle age is very important, I think, and also uh, the, the, the what do you do after retirement? I think it's very important. So, for instance, if you go further, women basically have less access to training. They are in low uh, social work, social categories of work, and of course, they may suffer more from that. Yeah, it's true. Less access. So it could be it could be why we find the very robust uh, result for women, or we don't now, find for. I would be very interested in finding studies on benevolence, being very active as benevolence, mm -hmm. and having them scoring the same mm -hmm. test. It's true. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. So you, in fact, is it? And maybe you yeah. will find some yeah. answer there. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I. I agree. I totally agree. Thank you. And now I will present. Uh, 
to Ismael that he also is a researcher in the in the chair and now enjoy <laughs> So hi everyone. So I'm going to present you a, a preliminary version of a paper written jointly with uh, Amélie Adeline, Raquel Fonseca, and Pierre Carl Michaud. So the idea of this paper is to investigate the relationship between income volatility and health. So we use data from the Longitudinal International Study of Adult which give us information on, on physical health and mental health in 2012 and 2014 for almost uh, 20,000 respondents for each year. So for each respondent, these data has been merged to administrative data on family earnings between 1982 and 2012. So what we do is for each respondent, we first run an estimation of earning shocks that have been experienced between 1982 and 2012. And then, based on these results, uh, we estimate the effect of uh, these earning shocks on different dimensions of uh, health in 2012 and 2014. So I will now give you an idea of how we estimate earning shocks based on uh, administrative data. So here's an example of uh, the earning evolution for a fictional person between 20 years old and uh, 70 years old. So we see that earnings fluctuate a lot, but we also see a general pattern of how earnings evolve uh, with age. So this pattern, is what we will call the predictable growth of earnings. So we can see the predictable growth as the expected earnings evolution over the life cycle for a particular individual. And the difference between the actual earning and the predictable growth is the volatility around the general path of earnings over time. So this volatility can be due to a different event that we will call earning shocks. So from this series in red, we can compute the variances of earnings around the predictable growth for each respondent. And based on an on a econometric method uh, proposed by Carroll and Samwick in, 90, uh, in 1997, we can decompose this measure of earning shocks into variances coming from permanent and transitory shocks. So a permanent shock is an event that permanently changes the earning path for the remaining years. So an example of a permanent shock can come from a promotion at work where the salary increase permanently and change the path of the annual earning evolution for the remaining years. <coughs> on, the other, on the other end, a transitory shock is, a, is an event that temporarily changed the path of, earnings, of the earnings evolution. So we can think of events like a job loss, which reduce temporarily the uh, earning until when the person retrieve a, a new job. So here, uh, here's a graphic of uh, our estimated variances of permanent shock on the left and transitory shock on the right for uh, um, by group of uh, age of 10 years. So we see that the majority of these shocks are accumulated during early working age and then start to decrease after 40 years old. And here, the red line represents respondent in bad health based on a self-reported health variable. So we see that respondent in bad health seems to have experienced more important permanent and transitory shocks than respondent in good health. So to analyze the, uh, the effect of these shocks on health, we will use different measurements of physical and mental health. 
So first, we uh, create a variable of self-reported health that can take a value of zero if where's uh, zero or one, where zero uh, means that the respondent is in a good to excellent health, and one means that is uh, in fair or poor health. We also use a variable uh, of limitation in activities of daily living that indicate if the respondent has experienced some limitations. For mental health, we, use, we create a variable of uh, self-reported mental health where uh, once again zero means that uh, the respondent is in good to excellent mental health and one to, uh, means that he is in fair or poor health. We also create a variable that can take a value between zero and ten, which counts the number of psychological symptoms like being exhausted without any real reason, being nervous, desperate, restless, sad or depressed, good for nothing, feeling like uh, everything was an effort. And finally, we, uh, we took a variable of life satisfaction where the respondent must rate their life satisfaction between 0 and 10, where 0 means very unsatisfied and 10 very satisfied. So for our estimation, we, uh, do, we have five different specifications. So first, we only estimate the effect of permanent and transitory shocks on health. In the second specification, we control for the average earnings in the past years. The third specification, we control for uh, some demographic uh, variable. The fourth specification, we control for the number of time respondent had been married or in common law. And we also control for parents' uh, education. And finally, in the fifth discussion, we control for the number of employment insurance episodes. And we all run all these estimations for a total sample, for a sample of respondent age under um, 50 years old, and another one for a respondent over 50 years old. So for re self-reported health, we see a general pattern where the transitory shocks increase the probability to be unhealthy. So the effect of self-reported, on self-reported health can occur for respondent under and over 50 years old, but, but the, uh, the effect is much more important for respondent over 50 years old. And we see a very similar pattern for, uh, with uh, ADL limitation. So for uh, mental health, the effect is a little bit different so based on the self-reported mental health, we see that transitory shock once again increase the probability to be in bad mental health. But we also see that these, this relation only holds for people over 50 years old. And once again, we see a similar pattern for uh, the count of mental health symptoms and uh, life satisfaction. So in conclusion, our future work will be to, to uh, estimate permanent shock and transitory shocks after having simulated different public policy that can reduce earnings volatility. So for example, since we also have information on the presence of employment insurance allocation between 1982 and 2012, and also the exact amount of these allocations, uh, we will simulate an increase of these allocations. We will estimate a new set of permanent and transitory shock component, and then estimate the possible health improvement follows following this policy. And uh, another exercise we can do is uh, do the same thing by simulating different level of guaranteed minimum income. <coughs> so uh, thank you, if uh, you have any question. Yeah. Over 50. Why 50 since, because we are in aging here. 
OMS starts aging at 50, but we know if we are looking about Raquel's speech, retirement is very far to 50, so... Yeah, it's a... Uh, we, we, we think about uh, around these estimation with uh, people over 50, uh, 65, but uh, the sample was very, uh, was too, uh, too small to, uh, very, uh, to uh, identify the, the relation. So uh, this is why for a moment we, uh, we, uh, we cut. Uh, the yeah. Do you know at what time of your life, so at what age, this is the top of your income in average and in the population? Is it 50 and is for that that you divide, or is it at 48 that you're on your top of your income? So the top of uh, 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 for our sample, uh, I have to verify it. So, but uh, generally, it's around 50, uh, 55. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now the the last, the best for the last, <laughs> Guy Lacroix. <laughs> Ma présentation n'est pas... Euh... Bon, on, on va s'arranger. Est-ce que je peux poser une question à Israël, du coup Parce que nous avons parlé avec Richard, et c'est un bon point. Est-ce que vous avez divisé votre population basée sur l'emploi public, où nous n'avons pas de choc, parce que notre job est sécure, versus privé Oui. Privé versus public But I, we don't have the information of uh, the kind of the type of job uh, in uh, the life cycle. So between 1982 and two, uh, 2012, we don't have this information. So it's not possible to. Uh, and we to can divide. we push on the for today. Yeah. The what the person who know today and then retire in two was your last job. Yeah, but it okay. doesn't mean that you were in a public. Uh, we have another question here. <laughs> I'm not sure if I, I totally understand. Uh, earnings were, were uh, self-reported? No, it, uh, it comes from administrative data. So that comes from the, the government of Canada. When you uh, do your... Uh, when you... Uh, what is the word in English? Is that poor? When you pay your tax, you have to declare your uh, income in uh, the year. So the, this is where I come from the information that has been merged to uh, our data set for each respondent. Did you have a lot of missing data? Because it's very common to have missing data nope. on, on farm. No, you don't have any missing data, and you cannot have any uh, measurement error on it either because uh, it is the, the real amount. Of, Unless you, uh, you work uh, you don't, and you did not declare your, uh, <laughs> your income. But, uh, yeah. Bon, alors, euh, tout d'abord, j'aimerais dire en français un remerciement aux organisateurs pour euh, avoir invité des économistes dans une conférence de non-économistes. Euh, <rire> Généralement, quand on m'a demandé de, de venir présenter, je n'avais pas la moindre idée de quoi j'allais vous parler. Alors, j'ai trouvé. Donc, uh, so I'll, I'll begin in English. I'll switch to English. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I'll be talking about two different reforms that were implemented in Quebec over the years and how they impact the, um, the health of seniors. And, um, but before I do, um, <coughs> I thought I'd explain a bit what economists do. So what do economists do? There's this fiction uh, among most of you that we spend our, our lifetime doing cost-benefit analysis. And actually, I never did one in my whole life, neither did Raquel. So uh, we don't do cost-benefit analysis. We, we know how to do them, but we don't do them, okay? 
So we don't do that. So l let me tell you what a health economist is following what Wikipedia thinks we, we do. So uh, Wikipedia says health economics, health economics is a branch of economics concerns with issues related to efficiency. That's where the cost benefit comes in, in your mind. Um, effectiveness, cost effectiveness, uh, value and behavior in the production and consumption of health and healthcare, which is true. In broad terms, health economists study the functioning of the healthcare system and health affecting behaviors. We do that. But the one single word that, that keep, I work with doctors, and the only word they see is efficiency and effectiveness. Okay? And uh, yes, but we don't do that. Okay? If, if you look up the uh, WHO uh, website, what is health economics to them? Well, health economics is concerned with the connection between health and the resources needed to promote it, which is true. Resources here involve not just money, but also people, materials, and time, which could have been used in other ways. So how do we allocate these resources to achieve a certain goal? And that goal depends on your point of view. Is it from the individual's point of view? Is it from the hospital's point of view? Is it from the, the, the health ministry's point of view? Or is it from society's point of view? And according to which point of view you, you adhere to, your solution will be different. And I'll give you an example in a few minutes. So the underlying issue is that while the needs may be indefinite, I would have said infinite, uh, for health, food, shelter, and so on and so forth, the resources to satisfy these needs are finite. And th therefore, choices must be made which needs are, uh, about which needs are most important and how to manage the limited resources. We don't do that. This is, this is um, uh, um, uh, prescriptive. We don't do prescriptive. So when they say choices must be made, economists don't make choices. They just more or less measure the impact of alternative options. That's what we do. And we let policymakers choose for themselves what the best, the best course of action is. So in other words, to choose, this is what we teach our first course, first year undergraduate economics, to choose is to renounce. And there's an opportunity cost. So whenever you invest in one intervention, you're not inv investing somewhere else. And what you're renouncing is the next best alternatives. So then, to an economist, the cost of a, an intervention of a procedure is the cost of the foregone best opportunity. That's the cost we have in mind when we talk about opportunity cost, or what is the cost of inve investing in a given uh, intervention rather than another one, it's the opportunity cost. What, what am I renouncing to when I decide to do one, one intervention rather than another? So I'll give you a brief example. <coughs> paper I wrote recently with doctors uh, on the impact of nursing overtime in the NICU, the ne neonatal uh, intensive care unit. So the paper uh, talks about the uh, association between uh, nursing overtime, nurse staffing, unit occupancy, and, and the relation this has uh, on medical incidents and outcomes of very preterm infants. So what we did in that paper, we look at over 7,000 newborns in the neonatal unit the shield in Quebec City. And we, uh, using uh, eight years of data, every single newborn in, in the unit, we looked at the relation between um, nursing overtime and unit occupancy and the uh, medical incidents, uh, including nosocomial infections, which is the most uh, prevalent uh, 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 consequence. And we could relate very easily the extent of uh, uh, nursing overtime on nosocomial infections. Now, you might say, why does a hospital, why do we use, why do hospitals use so much uh, nursing overtime? Well, it's cheaper from the hospital's point of view to hire uh, nurses on an overtime basis rather than increasing their staff and having some of them idle for, for a little while. So the consequence of this is that the, the, the most effective, uh, from the, the hospital's point of view, the most effective uh, alternative is to use uh, nursing overtime. The consequence is that children I mean, we're talking about very preterm children here. And the consequence on their lifetime course is incredible. Nosocomial infections will, will, will affect the child for the rest of his life. So from the hospital's point of view, using nursing overtime is fine. But from society's point of view, uh, it's dramatic. So the cost society will have to bear for the rest of the, the ch that child's life is, is humongous. So again, from the, depending on the point of view you're looking at, it might be preferable to use nursing overtime. But from society's point of view, it might not be the case. 
And in a, in a sequel paper, uh, a paper that, um, before that, we, we wrote another paper, which was w w w how are registered nurse overtime determined? And actually, it's, uh, we, can act, we, can, we can very easily predict how many hours would be used uh, using standard variables. I mean, it's pretty easy. And so the point is, uh, from an economist's point of view, the interesting point is to relate the two of them. We can pretty well predict how much nursing overtime will be used in the future. And we know that increasing nursing overtime will have uh, impacts on the adult's children's health. So this is one example uh, of where, of course, what the doctors wanted to do was the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, what do we gain from hiring nurses on full-time rather than hiring them with, with additional uh, overtime? And uh, I didn't want to go this way because we need more data. We need a lot of data to, to uh, calculate the costs to the society, the cost of the government, the cost of the hospital, and so on and so forth. But you can see where they were coming from. They, when they, their intent was to look at, they were arguing for more full-time nurses. The hospital would say, no, it's, it costs too so much. On the other hand, it costs society a lot more for not hiring full-time nurses uh, in an IQ. So this is where cost-benefit would be useful. Okay, so I'll leave the newborns aside. We're uh, we're not talk we're not in the pediatric con conference here. So let me show you a few examples that will be challenging. Some data that'll be that show the challenge we're facing as a society in the coming years. This is Quebec. Uh, what you have here is a, a plot of different trends in the population. The yellow line, uh, you must read the the right hand side um, uh, scale. This is the uh, median age in the population. So if you go back to 1970, the median age of the population in Quebec was more or less 27 years of age. If you go to 2015, it's now 42. So we've gone from 27 to 42 years of age as the median age in the population. And the, um, the blue line, the blue dotted line, is the proportion of individuals 65 and over in, in the population. And as of today, it's about 15%, 14% of, of the population is, is, 40, is 65 and over. And interestingly, the uh, green line is the uh, expected life ex um, expected life once you reach conditional on reaching 65. And this has been increasing as well from uh, more or less uh, 16 back in the 1970s to about 20 years. You can expect to live 20 more years if you make it to 65, okay? So in other words, the life expectancy conditional living until 65 is 85 years of age, more or less. <clears throat> now, why, why does that matter? Well, because of this. This is the uh, per capita public health expenditures by age group and by gender in 2010. And what you can see is that um, seniors, of course, cost a lot more than middle-aged uh, middle population. So very young, they're very young, they're expensive, they need a lot of care, and so do the, the uh, seniors. So as the population ages, uh, the proportion of people reaching 65, 70, 80, 90, and so on and so forth will increase. And that will put pressure on, 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 on government budgets. So the challenge is here. As of 2013, the proportion of the gross domestic product that was uh, devoted to healthcare was 8% uh, and get that 8.4%. Every March of every year, the government publishes a new budget, and using very simple models, we could predict very easily that Chitteris Paribus, if nothing else changes, by 2030, um, the proportion will be 13.5% of the gross domestic product will, will go to healthcare. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that the proportion of the government's budget on healthcare will increase from 43% to about 70, 69, 70 percent in 20 years time. This is unsustainable. Um, I mean, choices will have to be made. Unless we become very, very, very productive, there's no way we can afford this. So choices will have to be made in terms, because if you spend 70 percent of your budget on health, then that leaves that little for education, for everything else. So. An aging population, that's not only aging, it's, it's, there's aging, but it's also the cost of services and, 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 and care that are, are increasing. Drugs are, are increasing, um, more sophisticated equipment are increasing, and so on and so forth. So we, we think that the public expenditures on healthcare will increase by 30 billion in the province uh, between now and 20 years' time. 
and about 40% of this will be due to aging, and the rest being due to uh, more expensive equipment and drugs and so on and so forth. So that's a challenge, um, it's, and we're not the only one facing this problem. Uh, most Western societies face this problem, but it is a problem. And choices must be made and policies must be used uh, with the maximum efficiency as possible. <coughs> so scarcity of resources, choices. Choices were renounced to alternatives. So I'll just mention briefly two programs that we, uh, we uh, spent some time uh, evaluating uh, recently. So the first one is what so-called the Access to Surgery program. And the other one is the new guidelines for uh, colorectal cancer screening in Quebec. So the Access to Surgery program was introduced in 2004, uh, 2004 and it is, it's the first uh, activity-based funding program in the province. Typically, uh, hospitals would receive a budget that was uh, a function of their past expenditures. Irrespective, so this year's budget had nothing to do with the level of activity. It had to do with how much money you, you, you spent the year before or the five years before. It wasn't sort of a moving average of your past budgets. So for the first time, the government introduced uh, an, an activity-based uh, uh, program. And the financial, so hospitals received uh, financial incentives to, uh, to induce them to improve their productivity, uh, enhance their productivity and optimize their management in order to uh, reduce their waiting list. Now, a waiting list to an economist is what we call non-price rationing. You cannot buy a good because it's too expensive, or you cannot buy care because you have to wait for it. So non-price rationing basically means that while you're waiting to receive your care, it's, you're, 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 um, you have to pay a cost. And that cost might be inactivity, it might be your, your health might decline, but it's a huge cost. So waiting lists, as we know them in, in Quebec, is a huge societal cost. It's the same cost as mothers or, or parents who uh, register their child, their, their yet-to-be-born child, or their yet-to-be-conceived child in a daycare center, knowing that there'll be rat non-price ration. They want, there's not enough slots in the system, so they register their yet-to-be-born child to a daycare, hoping that perhaps before the child is one or two years old, he'll receive the uh, public daycare services. So this is non-price rationing. Okay? You cannot consume, not because that it's too expensive, you cannot consume because it's just not there. So, so the government wanted to induce hospitals to be more productive and reduce their waiting list. And uh, some additional funding um, was, was provided, uh, in other words, additional funding was provided uh, above and beyond your sur surgery volumes of, of the past year. So really, hospitals that increase their productivity would receive funding, others would not. So this is the first uh, program that, that, that was introduced back in 10 years ago. So the way it worked is the following. Anywhere between 2004 and 2011, whenever a hospital would uh, increase uh, a number of surgery above the 2003 level, they would receive $4,200 for every single operation. As of 2011, they changed that. So they, they ranked surgeries according to their severity, and hospitals receive anywhere between $500 and $9,000 for different types of surgeries. Not all surgeries are covered. Um, they focus on, on, on a given uh, number of surgeries. <coughs> and by 2012, they, they changed that once again. And uh, some of the surgeries that received 9000 nowadays receive only 7000 so this is a sort of a schedule and, uh, uh, to induce hospitals to change their behavior. So they're changing the relative price of, of, of surgeries in order to induce hospitals to change their behavior. That's what economists do. We change prices, we tax uh, goods, we tax cigarettes, we tax alcohol to induce individuals to consume less, basically. That's, and, or we subsidize uh, consumption of the given goods to, in order to increase the production and consumption of, of those goods. That's exactly what the government is doing with, with hospitals. <coughs> so, we wrote the first piece of paper with uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Thomas Cossigolo, and uh, what we did is the following. We, um, <coughs> we, well, you know all that, you all know that. We don't do clinical studies, we don't do randomized control trials, uh, but we use the same technique, same estimation technique, all difference and differences. And to do this, what we do is look at the uh, number of surgeries, uh, cardiac and thoracic surgeries that were conducted before 2004 and after, and we control this. We control this relative to heart bypasses. 
because heart bypasses were not covered by the, the ESP program. And we use a large administrative data set uh, from medical. Most of you, I guess, know this data set. And uh, we focus on hospital stays. How long do people stay in, in the hospital and uh, how much time before readmission, if at all, if there's a readmission at all. And we, pro we, we consider readmission as being a, a proxy for a, a quality of care. I won't go through all this. Uh, the first line is the most important one. So the uh, difference, difference estimator. So what we find is that um, if you subsidize hospitals, um, the duration of all the stays in hospitals decrease. So you might not see this, but it's red, it's negative. So it means that the duration between discharge to go home, or discharge to go to the uh, CSC or LCSC, or other, you might go somewhere else, um, systematically, the duration decreased in, in all, all hospitals. Uh, and there's no evidence at all of readmission. So this, in order to, to induce, so the waiting list decreased dramatically. Um, uh, so it worked. Uh, what I'm not saying here is that other surgeries were sort of left aside to make room for the more paying. Uh, uh, so there was a consequence of this. Hospitals favored all those surgeries that were paying more at the expense of uh, surgeries. So uh, what I'm reporting here is the impact of the financial incentive on those um, surgeries that were uh, paid for by the, the program. <clears throat> another way to look at this is to use, again, a difference in the efficient estimator. But this time, this is another PhD student of mine, uh, Nizal Gedi, and a colleague of mine, Ben Afortain. And this time around, what we did, well, let's focus on, let's use a control group, uh, British Columbia. Now, there were no uh, uh, intervention, there were no special programs going on in British Columbia over that period of time. So we focus on hip and knee surgeries. And we compare the evolution of those surgeries in Quebec relative to what happened in British Columbia. So we had similar data for British Columbia and, and Quebec. So we, um, we had huge sample sizes. And we focus on waiting times and hospital stays. How long do people stay in the hospital? And how long do they wait before they have to be, before they get uh, the operation? So. Just to show you an example, <clears throat> you might wonder, if you look at Quebec, for example, waiting time for a knee operation is about 154 days, and a hip operation is 141 days. So this non-price rationing I'm talking about is that's how long you have to wait, six months before you get operated on. And in British Columbia, it's even worse. It's 173 days on average before you get your knee operation, and 160 days before you get your hip operation. Now, hospital stay, is three, three days longer in Quebec than in British Columbia. Yet we have a universal health system in Canada, and you might wonder why is it that people in British Columbia stay less, few, fewer days in the hospital than Quebec? I mean, well, what, what can explain this, given that we basically have the same universal system? So the characteristics of the, po the two populations are identical. Uh, the same age, seven years of age, uh, um, same proportion of females and males. And in Quebec, the amount, you see, funding was about $27 million per hospital for carrying those hip and knee surgeries. So what we did, very uh, easy evidence, this, the, the red line is when the uh, ASP program was implemented in Quebec. And you can see that the duration, the waiting times to be, to be operated started declining right after the, uh, the program was implemented in Quebec. Not, nothing much happened in British Columbia. Same thing with the hip replacement surgeries. So the waiting time decreased in Quebec, uh, and nothing happened much in, in British Columbia. And the duration, I will, I'll, I'll skip that. So that's the how long you stay in, in the hospital. So you can see that Quebec, we, patients stay longer in the hospital um, uh, during their operation. And it's also the case um, later on. But for the hip, we can see that, uh, that's what we find statistically, that for the hip operation, the stays shorten in Quebec relative to what they were previously and relative to what it, what, what it was in British Columbia. So, so what we find is that the uh, program had significantly reduced waiting times for hip and knee surgeries. It worked. Uh, it worked for the heart uh, operation. It worked for the hip and knee operation. So, I mean, you sort of expect that because if you give hospitals uh, additional funding to do, to do those operations, well, the, the least you can hope is that it works, but it does. And uh, we have no evidence at all that these operations, the shorter duration actually uh, uh, translated into more readmission. So in terms of efficiency, not efficiency, but in, in terms of impact, it does work. Uh, finally, let me tell you about the uh, colorectal uh, cancer screening program. 
uh, again, a paper with my PhD student, Ms. Agali, uh, who's now a full-time economist with the uh, health uh, department. Um, so the number of colonoscopies has risen considerably in Quebec, yet many hospitals still struggling with very long waiting lists. And most hospitals do not have a mechanism to establish a priority list, and there are huge geographical variances, uh, variation within the province in terms of screening, uh, and, and, and from a purely uh, 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 equity point of view, this is unjustifiable, that if you live in, in Gaspé or if you live in, uh, in Outaouais, you have to wait way longer than, say, Quebec City or, or Montreal. Okay, so what we did, uh, the government introduced uh, a new program back in 2010, and that, according to that program, it sets standards for the screening procedures, identifies the steps that must be followed, and so on and so forth. So, so, so the screening mechanism is, is, is uh, overviewed by a very specific protocol, and uh, whenever um, uh, hospitals increase their, um, their um, uh, uh, screening, they get additional financing once again. Okay? So, we wanted to measure the impact of this program, and so what we did, again, a difference in difference estimator. We have nine hospitals that were part of the program originally, and 75 were not within that program. So we use uh, administrative data, once again, to look at the uh, length of stay uh, at home, um, uh, readmission and mortality in and out of the hospital. So again, if you compare the uh, treatment group, those are the hospitals that were covered by that program, that protocol, well, they have basically the same population. They're deserving the same population, same age, same gender, uh, uh, same, same severity of, of cases, and so on and so forth. But the, uh, there are slightly larger hospitals than the control group. Okay? I want to go through this just to show you the results. So the implementation of that program shortened the duration by about three days in the hospital. The duration in all states decreased. Uh, and there's no evidence at all of uh, greater readmission within 30 days following your operation, and uh, no evidence you know, so, so, uh, whatsoever of increased mortality. Now, the program is cost efficient. I didn't do that. Nizal did it. I didn't do that. Okay? That's part of his PhD thesis. is one chapter when, in, where, in which he, he, he calculates the cost efficiency of that program. It's cost efficient, okay? but I, I didn't do it. Okay? He did because he, he was working for the Department of Health and he wanted it. So, in other words, so to conclude, um, uh, we have an aging population and, and, and I, I'm, I'm getting there, okay? Uh, I, I'll be in, in, on the left-hand side sooner than later. And the fact that we have this very specific demographic changes in Quebec, uh, which is quite different from other provinces, where we're, we're aging faster than they are, uh, it constitutes a significant challenge for our healthcare system. Um, health, yet, health economics is concerned with the optimal allocation of resources. That's what we do. Where do we invest? And uh, which, w where do you get the most bang from your bucks, as we say? Okay? But again, um, from, what, from which perspective? Is it, what, 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 what matters? Is it the hospital's point of view, the government's point of view, or society's point of view? A hospital re will reallocate resources between departments, between units. It can do that, but it has a closed budget, just like a university. Uh, it might reallocate funding from one faculty to the other. It might reallocate funding from one department to the other within a hospital. And from the administrator's point of view, all that matters is where do I, put, where do I invest my money uh, best within my hospital. But from the government's point of view, it's totally different. From the government's point of view, you have they have to think about reallocating, reallocating resources between health, education, environment, infrastructures, and so on and so forth. Now, given that the aging of the population would put additional uh, pressure uh, to increase the budgets on, 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 on uh, health, choices must be made. Um, how, how can we deal with this? It's, it's a very big problem, uh, but it's a problem we have to face uh, 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 as a society. And finally, from a society's point of view, um, the best that we can hope for is to reallocate resources so as to maximize what we call positive externalities, meaning that we want less poverty, we want less pollution, we want lo longer life expectancy, and so forth and so on. So the problem to conclude is that we have an aging population. We put, put more pressure on healthcare, on healthcare and health budgets. So how do we, how do we cope with this? And um, again, choices must be made. And um, Choose choosing is renouncing. So if we put more money in healthcare, where do we cut? 
And that's a choice that must be made uh, as a society, but it's the one that we will be facing in the coming, coming years. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Pushing the You're just pushing. Mm. So my question is then, is this, is this taken into account? Of course. What? Yes. This graph, what it shows you, it, it, it's uh, this graph. Let me get back to it. Yeah, this one. This graph, uh, this graph accounts, this is what we spent in 2010. Yeah. OK? Yeah. Now, imagine that you plot over this graph. The pyramid, your, your age pyramid. Yeah. So that that age pyramid is moving rightwards, okay? But the, and the needs as well. And the needs as well. So, that, so why would that increase? That, that, that's what I'm, maybe I'm, I'm not even. So, so if it's pushed. Because you have fewer and fewer people in the middle to pay for those costs. Well, well that's, then that's a different. No, but it's the same thing. I mean, the costs are rising because. What I'm saying here is that aging is on, only accounts for 40% of the co increase in costs. The other 60% is due to drug prices that are just skyrocketing, more expensive uh, interventions, more expensive equipment. Right. More, this is very true. And, and so what, what we're saying here is that that increase in cost is accounted for by, I hate windows, okay? <laughs> okay. So what we're saying here is that 40% of that increase is due to aging. 60% is something else. But the main problem is, I'm, I'll be part of the problem in 10 years' time, okay? So as we age, there are fewer and fewer people behind to pay for those costs. And, and this, is, this is this graph here. Okay, so the proportion of people 65 and over is increasing, the proportion of the, the, the violet or the purple line on top is the proportion of uh, people between 0 and 19, and they're decreasing. And those are the taxpayers that will have to pay for me later on. So unless this generation becomes very productive, I mean, 0 19, my kids are 22 and 25, and every time I talk, I talk to them, I'm going to cost you a, a bundle when I get older. And they'll be right in the, you know, they'll be 40 and 45 by the time I'm 65, 75. And they'll be, you know, full income. And they'll have to pay a lot of taxes. But you agree that, in fact, it's not the net amount of health costs that increases. Because, in fact, I mean, people will be healthier until later in their life. Yeah, but so you, again, you're just pushing this, yeah, right? Yeah, you're pushing. Sooner or later, you'll have to pay those yeah. costs. And, and you will, I, for one, will demand very, very expensive and very sophisticated care when I get to 80. And perhaps the government will say no. Uh, remember 10 years ago, uh, Marie Dumont, who was head of a political party, I mean, he said something that was shocking, but he said, I can, as a, as a senior, I can spend $50,000 playing uh, in casinos in New Jersey, but I cannot buy a better hip replacement. The government won't allow that, right? Remember that? So, well, I do. And uh, so in other words, what I'm saying is that it, since everything is covered by the government, the government has to make a decision. No, you won't get a top-notch hip replacement. You'll get whatever we, we provide you. And, and so the government will have somehow to manage those increasing costs. That's all I'm saying. Conditional on having fewer and fewer people able to pay for that. Yeah. 
right my baby. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. If you increase the number of babies, it's going to take 40 years before they settle the problem. So I'm, I'll be there. A very, very long-term solution, but making babies today won't help my case. <laughs> well, every my colleague, my old colleague, Jean Duclos. Uh, he became minister, and uh, the Harper government wanted to increase the retirement age from 65 to 67. First thing Duclos did when he became minister was to stop this. Okay, so I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a controversial issue, but everywhere in, West, in Western countries we're thinking about... Uh, but again, that goes back to what Fachel was saying. Uh, I mean, is it a good thing to ask people to work until they're 67, 68? And, and, and given what you said, I mean, people, my, I, my grandfather, when he was 65 years of age, was smoking his pipe and, and just waiting to die, basically. That's what he was doing. And 65, I, I hope I won't be like that when I'm 65. Uh, but people today are more productive than ever when they get to 65, 7 years of age. So it, I mean, there's no way the government, the government, no, the government doesn't pay anything. Society does. So there's no way we can afford those rising costs, given the, the pyramid of age as it's, it's moving, unless we change something. We have to change. We have to become very more productive, or we have to change the way we finance the system. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, doctor, for helping us imagining what to do with density population and the future. But I assure you that I vote concerning allocations, governmental allocations, uh, the third uh, point that you mentioned on uh, uh, going towards society. Mm -hmm. Because when you ask a person, would you like to, to be uh, um, living a long uh, lasting life? They immediately, immediately say, no, I'll be sick and dependent. And we have to uh, break, uh, break that, that uh, idea that is governing the mind and the body of the, the elderly. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I vote for the allocations towards society and uh, opening those minds that are kind of closed and uh, uh, doomed. Well, ideally, decisions should be made from, from the society's point of view. But if you're a hospital manager, what you're looking at is your budget and how you allocate resources within your hospital. And you don't care what happens once patients leave your hospital. The point is, I'm thinking about those, those, those very little children. I mean, they're newborns. And, and whenever they, 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 they have a nosocomial infection, the consequences is huge for those kids. And the, the, the hospital manager doesn't care. Well, doesn't care. It's, it's not his business to care to mind what happens to a child once he leaves his hospital. Society does care for this. So true, I mean, all cost-benefit analyses should be made from society's point of view. The problem is we don't have enough information to, to balance all those costs and benefits from everyone's point of view. So everyone makes his decision. The, the, the Minister of Health really doesn't care what, what happens to the Minister of Transportation if, if, if he wants more money for his, his, his own ministry. That's at the expense of another one. And so he doesn't care. But we should, as a, and again, a government is nothing more than uh, they, they, they make decisions on our, on our behalf, but it's our money. And, and, and all the analyses should be made from the society's point of view, not from some department or some manager's point of view, but from, from the society's point of view. I totally agree with you. So what's wrong with the, the very simple view that it's the people who vote the government in, so the government should be representing yeah. what the people sure. are. Sure, absolutely. And then the government redistributes it to unions, okay. pressure groups, you name it. They want to be reelected, right? Just think about the scandal that we, noted, that we witnessed in Quebec a couple of months ago about those uh, seniors in, in, in um, uh, what we call them, uh, CHSLD, right? They get one bath a week. The question is, why is that? Why don't we give them five? Why don't we give, well, we just don't have the resources to do it, right? Well, we could put more money in there, but where do we take it from? And then the Minister of Health might say, I want more money, but the Education Minister might say, no way, I need money for the poor in, 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 in Montreal, need, or the immigrants who come to Montreal need special, special care as well. So there are conflicting uh, needs, and uh, resources are limited, but the needs are infinite. So, I mean, there, you, might, you, might, you might have to make a choice, basically, and, and it's, it's, um, 
Very tough. Yeah, I guess um, my boss just said that I have to start there, so I'll. Uh, <laughs> Alors, je vous remercie. Merci, Raquel, pour vraiment une très, très intéressante euh, discussion et présentation. Et merci aussi à Mylène pour les présentations du début de l'après-midi. C'était vraiment un très bel après-midi. Et euh, donc, on, le, le, le colloque continue demain. Et maintenant, il y a un petit cocktail pour ceux qui le souhaitent. C'est en haut. Et donc, euh, on vous invite à, à participer. Merci.